1901, American traveler and filmmaker Elias Burton Holmes would visit Seoul, Korea with four assistants, cameras, and projectors. He and his team would film the people and streets of Korea's capital and then show their work to many members of Korea's royal family. This would be the first time ever that a motion picture was viewed in Korea. This seemingly small screening would set off a chain of events that would make a once insignificant peninsular nation one of the most influential in the cinematic world stage. By the 1950s, the Korean people had experienced great agony and pain throughout the first half of the 20th century. Even going past the Korean War, Korea was occupied by Japan prior to that in like the early 20th century. Before then, it wasn't a very developed country. They experienced a lot of poverty. And then during the Korean War itself, there was a lot of political unrest and economic and political instability. In 1952, newly elected President Eisenhower would visit Seoul to observe firsthand the war in Korea. By the end of his trip, he was determined to end the conflict. He was quoted by saying, we could not stand forever on a static front and continue to accept casualties without any visible results. Small attacks on small hills would not end this war. However, both leaders from South and North Korea felt that they could emerge victorious from the fighting and unite the peninsula. It took Eisenhower's public warnings of the possible use of nuclear weapons in Korea for the Chinese and Soviets to put pressure on North Korea to enter peace talks. The South soon followed suit, and on July 27, 1953, the Korean Armistice Agreement was signed effectively ending the Korean War. Only five South Korean films from this era have survived to the present day. The South Korean film industry was, for all intents and purposes, dead, while across the Pacific, Americans were enjoying their golden age of film. Sitting President Syngman Rhee looked to awaken the cinematic world of South Korea, and in the first year after the war, he exempted the film industry from all taxes. This, coupled with donations from international sources of film equipment and resources, pushed South Korean cinema on a path to success. In 1955, South Korea entered what is known as its golden age of film. The cinema industry boomed as Korean directors finally had the creative freedom and means to create films that were their own and not just a product of military propaganda. In 1958, over 100 movies were released in South Korea, compared to a measly eight made only five years prior. While this era would be relatively short-lived, some of the most highly regarded directors in South Korea's history released what many consider to be their magnum opus. In 1960, Kim Ki-young released The Housemaid, a film about a piano teacher's affair with his maid and the havoc it wreaks in his home as a result. The film is seen as one of the most influential in history, not just in Korea, but around the world. Even American directors such as Martin Scorsese have cited The Housemaid as inspiration in their work. Only a year later, Yoo hyun Muk released his highest rated and most famous film, Aimless Bullet. Oh Baltsun, which is the Korean translation of the title, tells the tale of a broken family dealing with everyday life in post-Japanese occupation Korea. Aimless Bullet is one of the more obvious examples of a film that communicates how the golden age of Korean cinema was impacted by the many years of turmoil and war that preceded it. These feelings of hopelessness and pain permeate Korean film into the present day. But it can be seen in the golden age especially, since the directors that were making these films lived through these traumatizing events. All of those hardships that the people faced is kind of ingrained in Korean culture. I also feel like Korean cinema can tend to lean towards darker themes. The reason for that is because the culture of the people themselves have experienced all of these hardships. Creating you know, a piece of work that reflects that or is reminiscent of that might even be therapeutic for the people that are making it. Or at the very least, it is a way of them expressing their feelings of, if not them personally, their heritage, their ancestors, their people had gone through. In 1961, Park Chung-hee led a military coup that took over the South Korean government. And a year later, as part of his mass reduction of press and overall expression, the motion picture law was enacted, which increased the government's control in South Korea's film industry. The law would rapidly reduce the number of film companies operating in the country. And while the original law would also help to increase the demand for domestic films due to a quota system on foreign ones, this stimulation would not be long lasting. Government involvement in South Korean cinema would only get heavier. However, as the 60s wind down, Korean filmmakers still rolled out critically acclaimed, commercially successful films. In 1967, applauded director Kim Soo Young released his most popular film, Mist, among 10 other movies in that same year. This would be a common theme amongst Korean filmmakers in the 60s, as many directors would film a new project every couple months due to the high demand. However, 
this clamor for new films would not last. In the late 60s, television began to take off in Korea, and by 1969, there was a television in 9 out of 10 South Korean homes. And as the South Korean film industry was scrambling to find new ways to reach the newly engaged public in a new decade, Park dropped the bomb. In 1973, Park Chung-hee enacted his fourth and final revision to the motion picture law, which would be the most restrictive version yet. It called for an increased level of censorship on any themes that may be considered politically or socially aware. It was essentially a death sentence. It reached a point where over 80% of films were returned for revision due to inappropriate themes. As the rest of the film world was entering the 80s, producing ambitious features like Kubrick's The Shining and Kurosawa's Kagemusha, the Korean film industry remained stagnant. However, in 1984, the South Korean government began to ease their restraint on the film business. The motion picture law was revised, with the new version permitting some independent filmmaking, which had previously been outlawed completely. The newly edited law also allowed for more film companies to operate. However, under this new alteration, foreign films were now allowed to be shown in Korean theaters. This created a problem for South Korean filmmakers, as it was very difficult for them to compete with Hollywood's movies, even on their home turf. In 1993, this issue reached an all-time high, as Korean films managed to make up only 16% of the annual theater attendance. And while at the time, it seemed as if the permitted showing of foreign cinema to Korean audiences had killed the domestic film business, it turned out to do exactly the opposite. The introduction of foreign film would inspire millions of young South Koreans to develop a passion for storytelling in a film medium. For Park Chan-wook, it was Hitchcock's Vertigo. For Kim Ji-woon, it was the films of Indian director Satyajit Rai. These young, impressionable kids would, for the first time, watch films that challenge their immature perspective not only on movies, but on life. There is an ancient Korean proverb that reads, A dragon rises from a small stream. The closest thing to a translation to English would be rags to riches. Stories of great, influential people coming from unlikely environments are as old as time in Korea. An entire generation of young filmmakers from that same, small, unassuming country in East Asia were getting ready to write their own chapter. With a new sense of inspiration and understanding, and recently discovered rights to create, in the mid-1990s, South Korean film entered the era that is known as the Korean New Wave. One of the earlier films that captured the major themes of this era of cinema was Park Kwang Soo's A Single Spark. Released in 1995, this film details the life of a man who set himself on fire in protest of unjust labor laws. Criticizing capitalism and its effects on society became one of the more prominent messages in films from the Korean New Wave. The movie's writing credit went to a mostly unknown man in the industry by the name of Lee Shang Dong. This would be one of Lee's earliest projects, as he would go on to be one of the most well-known filmmakers in South Korea. Lee's films tend to explore the human capacity to withstand trauma, whether that be physical, mental, or a mix of the two. A prime example of a Lee work that encapsulates this theme is Peppermint Candy. The 2000 film follows the life of a deeply troubled man who has experienced extreme trauma in the form of loss, failure, and war. This film draws great influence from the scarring history of South Korea, as the man's troubles mirror many of the nations at large. Two years later, established director Park Chan-wook would release a film that would signify the beginning of one of the more dominant genres in Korean film, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. This movie would be the first of Park's Vengeance trilogy, and while it was one of the earliest South Korean pictures that explored themes of vengeance, its sequel would be the more influential film in the genre. Old Boy would be released a year later, and it is regarded by many to be one of the greatest revenge tales in film history. Filmmakers such as Kim Ji-woon, Lee Shang-dong, and even Bong Joon-ho would release revenge movies in the years that followed. This trend would cause revenge to be one of the more identifiable tropes of the Korean New Wave and Korean cinema as a whole. Vengeance, the typical connotation for that word is negative, it's just spiteful. But the other side of vengeance is retribution, is like justification. I think that there is a lot of that scene in Korean culture as well. As a whole, society, Korean people almost have this sense of righteousness. And I think that plays an important role in vengeance. And the other side of the vengeance would probably come from all of the hardships and all of the things that the Korean people had faced, going through what they had gone through with the war and um, being annexed by Japan and just experiencing like poverty. So I think those two things mixing together kind of creates a culture where the theme of vengeance is a recurring thing.
Park Chan-wook would go on to direct a number of other successful films in the next 15 years, such as Sympathy for Lady Vengeance and The Handmaiden, the former of which featured two of the greatest Korean actors of all time. Song Kong-ho and Choi min sik would go on to become the faces of the South Korean film industry, as the two would have fantastic performances in films for the next two decades. Song has starred in many different roles, ranging from vampire to taxi driver, and although Choi min sik's roles seemed to blend together at times, his performances still managed to wow audiences. And while the work of Park Chan-wook, Lee Shang-dong, and Kim Ji-woon have all made a mark on the nation's cinema, there's only one name that is synonymous with Korean film. Bong Joon-ho. Bong Joon-ho made his directorial debut in 2000, with Barking Dogs and Never Bite. And while it was fairly well received by critics, it bombed at the box office. However, the movie did not go completely unnoticed. Song Kong-ho applauded Bong for the film, which prompted him to sign on for Bong's next project, Memories of Murder a true crime story about a Korean serial killer. The movie was a hit, both financially and critically. This flung Bong into the national spotlight, and in the years that followed, he released Mother, Snowpiercer, and Okja, all of which were socially and politically aware in their own unique way. Bong's ability to blend and shift genre and tone in his films have allowed him to become one of the most versatile directors in the industry. Bong has used his films as an avenue to condemn capitalism throughout his career. In Snowpiercer, he is very crude in his critique, as the film explores class struggle with a literal separation of class on a train. In Okja, Bong shows how the system encourages greed and inhumane practices in industry. Bong's next film, however, would be much more subtle. As production of Snowpiercer came to a close, the film's distinctive allegorical story of the gap between rich and poor still weighed heavy on Bong's mind. And as Bong began to write for his next project, these themes of economic disparity would bleed into this new story. On May 21st, 2019, Parasite premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in France. The film follows the interconnected lives of two families, one rich and one poor. Their interactions act as a metaphor for the relationship between the upper and lower classes in today's society. Critics raved, as the film would go on to win the festival's most prized award, the Palme d'Or. Oscar buzz surrounded the film as it debuted domestically and internationally later in that year. And as award season came along, the accolades piled up. And the Oscar goes to Parasite. Parasite became the first non-English film in history to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, and it would go on to tally prizes at both the Golden Globes and the British Film Awards. The attention these awards garnered allowed for the movie to act as an introduction to Korean cinema for many across the world. It opened the door for millions to finally overcome the daunting obstacle of subtitles and become engrossed in a whole new world of film. I really think Parasite made waves for how influential Korean cinema is internationally speaking. Now Korea kind of plays on the world stage. And this spotlight has given other Korean storytellers the opportunity to shine internationally. The Korean new wave led by Bong, Park, Sung, and Choi is just part of a massive rise in popularity of Korean media across the world. Along with other major mediums such as K-pop, manhwa, and Korean television, South Korea is entering an era in which the nation has significant cultural influence worldwide. And much of this recent success is due to visionary filmmakers that led the way when South Korea was a cultural afterthought. And with the foundation laid, the future of South Korea's film industry is bright. Korean cinema has definitely left an impression on the world, but I believe that it's only going to continue to grow and really just make more and more of a difference on an international setting. 30 years ago, South Korea's film industry was non-existent. Koreans didn't even watch Korean movies. And thanks to the work of Bong, Park, Lee, Song, Choi, and countless others, the films from that same small and significant country are some of the most respected works released year in and year out. The stream that birthed dragons has since grown deeper and wider, as its waters have overflown the banks of those who never saw it coming.